Our next speaker and the last one for this session is uh, Dr. Graham Holloway from University of Guelph, titled uh, Mitochondrial Bioenergetics in Peripheral Tissue with Insulin Resistance. Yeah. It's always the moment of truth when your computer's connecting. Hey, okay. Uh, thank you very much for the introduction, uh, and thank you to uh, David Hood, wherever he is. I'm not sure if he remembers it, but was that the first MHAD award? Or uh, first MHAD presentation as well. So thank you for the continued support over the last 13 years. And then some novel uh, observations that we have on potential for dietary nitrate to affect mitochondrial bioenergetics in a diabetic heart. So if we think about the typical model, I tried to come up with a way of summarizing the better part of 20 years of uh, research on the development of insulin resistance. But a lot of models really focus in on overeating and a high fat diet. And when we have a diet like that, especially in rodents, we can develop rapid changes in white adipose tissue morphology and function. While we do get hypertrophy and sometimes hypoxia as potential mechanisms to contribute to insulin resistance, those really take a bit of time to develop. And some of these other intracellular events happen very quickly, within 24 to 48 hours. When we get the macrophage infiltration, we get a lot of inflammation, we get insulin resistance, and then we get the suppression of lipolysis being prevented because insulin normally suppresses lipolysis. There's a lot of mechanisms that happen within the adipose tissue very quickly. In our hands, uh, mitochondrial targeted antioxidants seem to prevent the acute response of a high fat diet in adipose tissue. Once we have that uh, decreased insulin signaling response, we get less uh, suppression of lipolysis and free fatty acids seem to develop uh, pathological changes within these peripheral tissues. So we can get impaired glucose homeostasis and insulin resistance because of the negative effects of lipids on uh, skeletal muscle and liver. And probably the two most common cited mechanisms that I can see in the literature are reactive lipids, so diacylglycerol and ceramides, and uh, mitochondrial reactive oxygen species. While heart is typically not associated with our discussion on insulin resistance, obviously you can get the development of atherosclerotic lesions and hypertension, which can affect the heart. And in some instances, you can get what's called diabetic cardiac myopathy, which is inability of the left ventricle to produce force in the absence of a change in blood pressure. So when we think about the health of the individual, obviously adipose tissue can have pronounced effects when it's not working properly. If I think about the continuum of health, as exercise physiologists, we typically think about exercises being beneficial and inactivity being detrimental. But in this model, there's really no mention of physical inactivity. It was really a high fat diet perspective. So I had the opportunity to go work in the Netherlands as part of my sabbatical in Professor Luke Van Loo's lab and got to work on short-term bed rest in humans to try to tease out whether or not those mechanisms translated. So we had a couple of different cohorts of people where we put them into strict, strict bed rest for seven days and then did a battery of tests. I'm cherry picking a bit of data to try to make a point here. We can induce insulin resistance looking at the glucose infusion rate within seven days. But surprisingly, when we looked at the skeletal muscle, there was no change in diacylglycerol or ceramides. This is the total, but we do have the subspecies in the uh, paper as well. As a follow-up study, we looked at permeabilized muscle fibers to look at the production of reactive oxygen species, really hydrogen peroxide in the presence of succinate and pyruvate as a combined protocol. And after the seven days, we still didn't see a marked increase in the propensity to produce hydrogen peroxide. In particular, when we put in ADP, we get a marked reduction in uh, hydrogen peroxide emission, and there was no difference after bed rest. Again, cherry picking a bit of data. We can also look at markers of redox stress. There's numerous ones between the two different papers that we have. This is just the GSH to GSSG ratio, trying to highlight that we don't have redox stress when we have the development of insulin resistance from bed rest. So our two kind of main lipid models of reactive lipids and ROS don't really uh, get upheld when you go to bed rest. So it really does highlight to me that physical inactivity is a little bit different than the high fat models that we typically study in rodents. And we need to be aware of that. And if you go back to some of the old Scandinavian data from 2012, they also showed that physical inactivity through bed rest decreases the production or the accumulation of key proteins involved in the canonical insulin signaling cascade. 
And if you go back to the early 2000s, Barbara Kahn has a great paper in Nature using uh, heterozygous GLUT4 knockouts where a 50% reduction in GLUT4 impairs insulin-stimulated glucose transport about 50%. So these uh, reductions in GLUT4 content, I think, are really important in the context of physical inactivity, and we need to remember that. We also wanted to try to come up with a, a way of studying then insulin resistance in a mouse without a high fat diet and to really just look at obesity. And there aren't many models that really recapitulate this uh, by itself. And we were lucky enough to have a spontaneous mutation in one of our C57 colonies about 10 years ago. So these are aged match litter mates uh, that are about three months of age. Uh, and the animal on the right is about 75 grams and the animal on the left is about 25 grams. So you develop a hyperphagic model where they overeat on a low fat diet. So this diet happened to be 15% of fat and they'd still develop this massive obesity phenotype. If you read the paper, there's a lot of mechanisms that we've tried to tease apart. We uh, sequence the genome to try to look for it, but we think it's a polygenic form of obesity. But it is really just a hyperphagic model in the absence of a high fat diet that we're particularly interested in studying. I can uh, pull out the mitochondrial respiratory function from that paper, and this is isolated mitochondria from the heart, the red gas truck, and the liver. And we can look at with or without ADP, glutamate, succinate, or we can look at our stoichiometry in terms of the PO ratio as a marker of coupling efficiency. We can look at permeabilized tissue, so the uh, white adipose tissue on the bottom left, and we have permeabilized fibers from the red gas truck where we have this typical protocol with and without ADP and complex one and two leg substrates and then a dotted line there. We have lipids looking at suppression with uh, malonyl-CoA. We can look at submaximal ADP. No matter how we interrogate the mitochondria, we didn't see any change in respiratory capacity or oxidative phosphorylation across tissues despite this being the most aggressive form of obesity and insulin resistance that I've ever seen. Uh, we did have uh, Morgan Fullerton do clamps for us on these animals and he actually had to turn off the glucose and fusion during the hyperinsulinemia because the length of time during the fasting condition meant that the liver was actually kicking out too much glucose to clamp glucose even though we had hyperinsulinemia going in. It's a very aggressive model and there's still no respiratory change in these mitochondria. But when we started to look at different tissues for the propensity of mitochondria to, to produce hydrogen peroxide, we see this consistent increase that we normally associate with a high fat diet. So it seems like this is conserved in models of obesity despite the absence of a high fat diet. And one of the things that we've been interested in studying over the last couple of years is the provision of ADP as a way to try to mitigate reactive oxygen species. So I've already shown you after bed rest, as you put in ADP, it dissipates that membrane potential and decreases uh, reactive oxygen species production very quickly. And so we want to try to come up with ways of providing ADP to the mitochondrial matrix. It's an exercise conference. Exercise is a great way to do that. But we're trying to find other creative ways of doing that. And this is when we got very excited when we saw papers coming out of Bruce Spiegelman's lab. And I know he's here today. And I'd love to hear his thoughts after my talk. Uh, because we were interested in trying to come up with ways of then uh, concentrating that ADP in that intermembrane space to, to affect white adipose tissue morphology. So the proposed model involves an alkaline phosphatase and creatine kinase to reconstitute that ADP as a way of affecting energy expenditure in beige and brown adipose tissue. And really, it's liberating a molar surplus of ADP. And if you look at that original experiment, after cold exposure, they can isolate mitochondria from adipose tissue. And the black bar is their vehicle. So it's just looking at oxygen utilization over three minutes in the presence of submaximal ADP. And the pink line is in the presence of creatine. And so the thought process then becomes, because you have this creatine kinase, it's uh, recirculating that ATP back to ADP, and it's driving respiration. There are four isoforms that are known to exist in humans. CKMT1 and 2 are mitochondrial ones, and it's supposed to be in the intermembrane space. And then there's the brain isoform and the muscle isoform as well, and the cytosol. We started by asking which ones could we detect in humans with the thought process of trying to interrogate if we could knock them out, if we would uh, predispose animals to diet-induced insulin resistance by negatively affecting the adaptive response. We had the opportunity to collaborate with Matt Watt down in Melbourne University, and he had a great paper in Cell Reports where he actually separated out uh, progenitor cells based on the availability of CD34 from human tissue. And the net effect is essentially to think about this as one of the groups has got a phenotype that's associated with beige or energy expenditure, and the other one at the bottom there is to do with storage. And so we interrogated that data and looked for the expression then of these creatine kinase genes in that beige phenotype is what we were looking for. 
So the first uh, panel there is the creatine metabolism gene. So it's got the transporter, the first one, and then it's got the um, enzymes involved in biosynthesis of creatinine. And we can detect that in human adipose tissue in terms of the progenitor cells. But we didn't see a concentration in beige uh, phenotype. We saw it in both the, the two different extremes of beige and, and the storage. We then looked for the expression of the alkaline phosphatases, and we could detect the ALPL, which has been the purported uh, alkaline phosphatase. But we really don't see a concentration of that phosphatase enzyme in the beige phenotype. When we looked at the creatine kinase genes, we could again detect a lot of the different uh, creatine kinase. In particular, CKMT2 is highly expressed, which uh, has been reported as well. And if you look, CKMT1, although it's lower expressed, was concentrated in that beige phenotype, and we could detect it in almost every uh, human sample that we looked at. Matt Watt also had proteomic data available, and so he looked at three different human uh, adipose depots and looked at the proteomic detection based on LCMS. And we could detect the alkaline phosphatase on the far right there. We could detect now the brain isoform. We could no longer detect the CKMT2 protein using this approach, but we did get a lot of CKMT1. And so we really wanted to uh, understand what CKMT1 was doing because there's less been studied about that particular um, protein. But if you go back to the original studies, if you knocked out UCP1, CKMT1 mRNA went up, arguing that there's a compensatory change to try to maintain energy expenditure. And conversely, when they knocked down CKMT1, you saw a compensatory increase in UCP1. So it seems to me that they're working in some fashion to affect energy expenditure. And in a follow-up paper, if you look on a high-fat diet, CKMT1 there in the middle also went up in the perigonadal fat pad. So it seems like CKMT1 mRNA is responding to a lot of different conditions. And so we really wanted to know what was going on with that particular uh, creatine kinase enzyme. So we had the opportunity to work with Henry Burnett, who's on the left, who's a postdoc in Marcello Mori's lab down in Brazil. And they used SHRNA uh, to knock down CKMT1 in cells. And you can see that the mRNA went down uh, quite nicely. And then we read seahorse experiments. The blue lines are the knockdown. The black are the control. And if you pay attention to the very first dotted line, that's when we added in exogenous crink uh, to the uh, experiment to see if it would stimulate respiration. And that is the delta change in the oxygen consumption in the presence of creatine in both the wild type and in the knockdown cells. Now, you can see from that bar, although we couldn't stimulate respiration with creatine, that the knockdown did have a higher respiratory response in that submaximal ADP environment at the beginning. And if you quantify it, you can see that there's a main effect. So clearly, knocking down that creatine kinase enzyme is doing something biologically. We just couldn't detect it when it came to respiration or with the presence of creatine. It does suggest, though, that CKMT1 is dispensable for that submax response, and we wanted to interrogate that a little bit further. So this is Valerie Politis Barber, who was a master's student in my lab, and we utilized a whole body CKMT1 knockout animal in the presence of either beta adrenergic signaling or you'll see afterwards high fat diet. So this is the CL experiments for four days, and you can see that we can induce a beige phenotype. So UCP1 goes up. We have the induction of mitochondrial proteins. Surprisingly, we couldn't detect CK beta going up, which has been reported as well. But when we looked at the whole body indirect calorimetry, we get the typical and expected shift towards fatty acid oxidation. Energy expenditure goes up. But when we pivoted and looked at our mitochondrial responses, there was no effect of knocking out CKMT1. So you can see respiration is higher there in this permeabilized adipose preparation because of the induction of mitochondrial biogenesis but we don't have an effect of uh, ablating the gene. And if we look at submax responses, every second bar is in the presence of creatine that we add into the te uh, test tube. And the insert is the drive with creatine. We could not stimulate respiration in the presence of creatine. There's actually a main effect for creatine to decrease respiration after CL administration in both genotypes. That's the IWAT. This is the GWAT data, just to highlight that we have data from multiple uh, depots within the animal, and they always respond the same way. So it seems that CKMT1 is also dispensable for the acute CL-mediated responses. And so we thought, well, maybe we've got the wrong stimulus, and we should look at high-fat diet. So we did an eight-week high-fat diet using the same animals. 
And the thought process there would be if uh, creatine kinase, the CKMT1 isoform, was important, we would predispose animals to diet induced insulin resistance because you would have less energy expenditure. After eight weeks, you have glucose intolerance, but there was no exacerbation by knocking out CKMT1. We can look at energy expenditure at the whole body level, and there was no difference with the genotypes. We can look at adipose tissue morphology, and there's no effect of the genotype, just a high fat response. When we look at our permeabilized tissue preparation, there's also no effect with the knockout. You'll notice now that after the high, after the high fat diet, respiration is lower, and that's because of that hypertrophy. So the denominator here is weight, and as adipose tissue grows, they develop obviously weight associated with that lipid deposition, and so now the denominator could really mess with some of our interpretations in terms of what's happening. So we have to be careful there. So I don't want people to focus so much on the fact that high fat diet decreased respiration as opposed to just that there was no effect of the genotype. And when we go to our with and without creatine experiment again, the inset shows the delta change with creatine. There was no effect regardless of genotype. And again, this is the IWAT, and for simplicity, that is my gonadal fat pad again to show the similarities between them. We've also tested male and females. We've tested housing temperature between 24 and 37 degrees Celsius. We've tested at diff different time points between CL, and we always get the same results. So it seems like it's a very consistent finding in our hands. So I think that the data can clearly say, despite the fact that we can detect CKMT1 mRNA and protein in human visceral depot, it doesn't seem to affect the development of high fat diet induced insulin resistance. It seems to be dispensable for this. It's important to think about potential limitations of your studies. I think one of them is timing of tissue collection. As I said at the outset, insulin resistance develops in adipose tissue very quickly within 48 hours, and this is eight weeks on a high-fat diet, and we chose that on purpose because we're trying to understand the potential to treat obesity and insulin resistance as opposed to sometimes the mechanisms at the onset. But this does have implications because it could be that other mechanisms are now overriding what we uh, could have seen. And it's also possible when you're doing a tissue preparation like this that the endogenous creatine is affecting the measurement. So if there is a tissue preparation and there's creatine in the test tube and it's already saturating for that enzyme, putting more creatine in isn't going to do anything because it's already saturated the system. To address the latter point, we went back and isolated mitochondria the same way that the original papers were. And this is isolated uh, mitochondria from adipose tissue. And you can see that if we put in submaximal boluses of uh, ADP, you can see little what look like pyramids. So that's the depletion of ADP. And from that, you can then calculate PO ratios to look at how the mitochondria are responding. And you can split this up with and without creatine. And we get graphs that look like this. So in isolated mitochondria and unstimulated tissue from adipose tissue, we can still not detect the ability of creatine to drive energy expenditure in this uh, system. So then we worried that maybe we needed to stimulate the white adipose tissue to develop this response. Again, if you look back at those original ones, uh, cold exposure or high fat diet was increasing the expression of these uh, genes. And so we did CL administration and then isolated the mitochondria from the white adipose tissue four days later. And now you no longer see this nice uh, peak and trough, so to speak, when we put in submaximal ADP because the mitochondria become uncoupled after we do CL administration. These are Western blots from isolated mitochondria, saline versus the CL, and you'll notice at the top there a huge accumulation of UCP1, which is then uncoupling the mitochondria, making it very difficult to study the coupling efficiencies of these. So we just looked at the total oxygen consumption over the five minutes in this submaximal response after the 100 nanomolar addition of ADP. And with and without creatine, you can see that there's still no effect of oxygen utilization, even after the CL administration. But it does really highlight that we also need to be careful when we're trying to study these tissues, because UCP1 is such a potent uncoupler that it's probably difficult to now study the effects of recycling ADP when we're trying to look at that. So we, we do need to be careful in terms of over-interpreting these data. And all I can say is I think our data highlights for sure that CKMT1 is dispensable because the knockout is the knockout. Uh, but the in vitro experiments, we definitely don't want to over-interpret. That being said, there's another paper that uh, came out uh, recently where they knocked down the brain isoform, and they also see this compensatory change in that submaximal uh, value in the seahorse. 
So it seems like whether I knock down CKMT1 in our hands or CK uh, beta in their hands, that there is an effect on biology. So clearly something is happening with these uh, enzymes that are affecting biology, but I, I unfortunately don't have a mechanism at this moment in time. Since we think mitochondrial ROS is a contributor to cellular homeostasis, we've linked mitochondrial ROS to inflammation, and this other paper has linked the brain isoform to inflammation. I think that it's going to be important moving forward to also consider these creatine kinase enzymes, not just in terms of energy expenditure, but potentially in terms of redox balance uh, and a broader context of maybe what it's doing within adipose tissue biology. So we also wanted to take a little bit of time to talk about uh, maybe a different way of trying to preserve mitochondrial bioenergetics uh, using nutritional interventions. One of the compounds that we've been interested in studying is dietary nitrate. We've been using that, obviously, as a follow-up to Andy Jones's work with uh, athletes as an ergogenic aid. But we started to think about it in terms of uh, preventing high fat diet induced uh, insulin resistance. There's a number of groups that have studied this. Uh, this is just a glucose tolerance from a Another group's uh, paper in PNAS showing that uh, eight weeks on a high-fat diet induces glucose intolerance. That's a red line, and if they simultaneously consume nitrate throughout the high-fat diet model, they can attenuate that response. This is data from our, our lab, and you can see the same basic response. So consuming nitrate in the drinking water can attenuate the detrimental effects of a 60% high-fat diet. And we really wanted to ask if this is related to affecting mitochondrial bioenergetics in diverse tissues. You can see from the title from the PNS paper, they were looking at NADPH oxidase, and so we're just looking at a different target for redox balance. Um, there's a couple of people that have contributed to this. Henver did the, uh, Bernetta, who's here, uh, did the adipose tissue work. So this is eight weeks on a high-fat diet with and without sodium nitrate in the drinking water. This is looking at adipose tissue, so EWOT um, lipid-induced hydrogen peroxide emission, and you can see high-fat diets dramatically increase that potential, potential to uh, emit hydrogen peroxide, and nitrate attenuates that. We can see differences in cellular markers of homeostasis. In this one, I've just shown you crown-like structures from the white adipose tissue, showing that nitrate can preserve that. Genevieve Desormio, who's a PhD student in my lab, who's also here, did the liver work. You can also see that the ability of a high-fat diet to induce hydrogen peroxide from mitochondria within the liver is attenuated while consuming dietary nitrate. There's improvements in markers of redox balance. I've just shown T-bars in this example. There's the mitigation of the accumulation of lipids within the liver while consuming dietary nitrate. And there was no change in respiration in either of these tissues. If you look at skeletal muscle, we can preserve uh, somewhat the uh, development of insulin resistance, and so this is insulin-stimulated AKT phosphorylation, so the white bar is the low-fat fed animal, the middle bar is the high fat again, and the uh, dark bar in the end there is with the nitrate, and so there's a partial preservation of skeletal muscle insulin signaling. There's a preservation of redox balance within the skeletal muscle, and so it really does seem that dietary nitrate preserves the redox balance in diverse tissues uh, in animals consuming a high-fat diet. So we really wanted to move beyond the glucose tolerance and look at the heart as well. And obviously, dietary nitrate is thought to be a vasodilator, which could impact blood pressure, which could have impacts on the heart, but we wanted to move beyond that as well. And so this is work that Heather Petrick, who is a co-supervised student between Luke Van Loon and myself, has been doing for the last uh, couple of years as well. So key takeaways from this is same model that we just used, eight weeks on a high-fat diet with and without nitrate. Um, the nitrate seems to attenuate cardiac hypertrophy. It preserves left ventricular stroke volume. It preserves left ventricular fibrosis. So all of these are typical markers of pathological remodeling within the LV, and the nitrate prevented it despite the eight-week duration of it. When we looked at the bioenergetics, this is the respiration, and like other tissues, there was no effect in permeabilized uh, fibers from the LV in terms of the respiratory capacity or the submax uh, ADP dynamic response. So just like the other tissues, it's not affecting respiration, but similar to the muscle, the liver, and uh, the adipose tissue, it prevented the typical increase that we see in redox imbalance. So this is succinate-induced hydrogen peroxide that's attenuated with or without ADP when they're consuming um, nitrate. So it seems like this is a very conserved response between tissues.
When you consume dietary nitrate, you rely on the commensal bacteria to reduce it to nitrite. And again, that can have an effect if it gets reduced to nitric oxide. But we started to wonder if maybe the metabolism of the gut microbiome, which is known to be altered with a high fat diet, could also be impacting these responses. So we worked with uh, Jonathan Scherzer at McMaster, as well as Emmer Allen Verco at uh, Guelph to look at the taxa level. And for simplicity, I've grouped them by the phylum level. And you see the typical increase in firmicutes on a high fat diet and the reduction in the bacterioides, but the nitrate prevented those responses. We've looked at typical uh, markers of short chain fatty acid metabolism, and unfortunately, we haven't been able to pinpoint a mechanism. So it does seem that the gut microbiome is changing, and we wanted to then determine if this could be uh, propagated to another animal. Importantly, when we looked at the availability of nitrate and nitrite within the feces of these high-fat nitrate-fed animals, there was no increase. So that little inset on the top right there is the ability to detect nitrate and nitrite in the high-fat fed animals with or without nitrate. So we took those feces and gavaged them into other animals consuming a high-fat diet for eight weeks, but we did this on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday of the seventh week. Waited a period of time and then did a battery of tests to see what was going on. Since there was no increase in nitrate or nitrite within the feces, it shouldn't surprise us that a week later there was no increase in serum nitrate or nitrite. But importantly in this model, there's no change in systolic blood pressure or diastolic blood pressure. So it's not a change in blood pressure if we see a change in heart function. We started by looking at the white adipose tissue, so cross-sectional area, crown-like structures, did nothing for this. So the gavage also did not impact uh, mitochondrial reactive oxygen species production or generic markers of cellular stress within the white adipose tissue. So it seemed like it wasn't doing anything major within the white adipose tissue. We get a similar response in skeletal muscle, so no change in respiration, no change in reactive oxygen species within the skeletal muscle. So it seems like those tissues uh, aren't responding to this short-term gavage. There's also no increase or, ch or reduction, I should say, in LV fibrosis. But there was a recovery of end diastolic volume and stroke volume. Six, so eight weeks on a high fat diet, we gavage in the fecal slurry for three days on seventh week, and a week later we still have this preservation of LV morphology, which was quite surprising to us. When we looked at the LV bioenergetics, there was no change in respiration, but there wasn't even when they were consuming the nitrate and the drinking water, nor was there a change in ADP sensitivity, which there wasn't when they were consuming the uh, nitrate and the drinking water, but the gavage also decreased mitochondrial reactive oxygen species production. So it seems like circulating nitrate and reductions in blood pressure are not required for the cardioprotective effects of what we're seeing in the LV, and in particular with that reduction in mitochondrial reactive oxygen species. I would love to be able to tell you what the mechanism is, but unfortunately, we're at a loss at this point in time, and we're trying to figure that out. So these studies continue with gavages and other metabolomics that are happening to try to identify what the mechanism is, but I think it's pretty interesting that it is so powerful and it happens so quickly. So I think at the start, I was trying to highlight that physical inactivity and high-fat diet induce insulin resistance through slightly different mechanisms, and we need to pay attention. Obviously, I think if you're physically inactive and consuming a high-fat diet, it would be even worse than either one independently. Um, mitochondrial reactive oxygen species uh, seem to be conserved between tissues and models of obesity. We have not been able to detect the futile creatine cycling in adipose tissue, but creatine still likely has a biological role because when we knock down those creatine kinase genes, we seem to see a consistency that submaximal respiration is increased. I think that our data solidifies that CKMD1 at least is dispensable for white adipose tissue homeostasis. And dietary nitrate seems to be affecting the gut metabolism in some way to influence whole body health. And so it can't be as simple as blood pressure control uh, impacting what we're seeing at that whole body level. These are the people that have obviously contributed to the work. We are lucky enough to collaborate with some great people. So Matt Watt down in Melbourne. Dave Wright has been instrumental within the University of Guelph. Luke Van Loon has done a lot of work with me over the years and continues to. Uh, Marcello Mori down in Brazil helped obviously with the uh, SHRNA with Dr. Heather Bernetta. 
Jeremy Simpson is a faculty member in our department who is a great resource and collaborator for the cardiovascular system. Emma Allen Bracco and Jonathan Scherzer have been doing a lot of the microbiome work for us. Uh, and we've also got some collaborators there from Paris who continue to help. And the students are on the left. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Dr. Holloway. I'm open for questions. <laughs> Hi. Are we all set there? Okay. Uh, we're all set. <laughs> I, I'm a little confused. Why would you center on CKMT1 when Lawrence Kazak has published the data showing that the dominant creatine kinase, at least in his murine studies, is CKB? So I think that the beta was one particular one that's interesting, for sure. There's also been work that come out of other groups that says beta is interesting. So we were particularly interested in the one just because it's a mitochondrial isoform and, and is, isn't a cytosolic isoform. And we could detect it both at the mRNA and the protein level. We were surprised when one didn't work, and we were even more surprised when we still couldn't stimulate respiration, even in the wild-type animals, which would have all creatine kinase isoforms, regardless of how we did it. So this has been, uh, when, the, when the first paper was published, we got very excited, and we've been doing this for four years, and we just have not found a way to get it to work. Well, I'm sure Lawrence will help you with that, but I do want to point out that CKB is a mitochondrial enzyme, and that was one of the points of Lawrence's paper. So please read Lawrence's paper. I know he, he's, it's, not an, it's not normally, but he found it that it resided in it. What do you mean it's not normally? It has a cryptic mitochondrial localization signal that he showed it goes into the mito, and you mutate the cryptic site. It doesn't go into the mito. I'm not going to disagree with you. It's there in his paper. I'm not disagreeing with you that the beta is there. OK, thanks. Yeah, one more here, and then we'll go over there. Go ahead. Looks like uh, you don't know what's happening. Did you do a RNA sequence uh, on the tissue and see any other pathways are involved? Uh, we haven't done that yet, no. This is, again, still work ongoing. Uh, and I think that it's important to report the pilot data that we have. I think that there's you know, not necessarily perfect data, but I think it's important for people to be aware of it. And we're continuing to try to figure out uh, you know, an explanation, for sure. And also look for uh, post-translation modification of proteins. Any of those things can explain it. Pardon me? A post-translation modification of proteins. Any of those changes are responsible for these uh, differences. Yeah, unfortunately, again, we don't have the ability to, to, to do that. I think that those are important ideas to consider for sure. Hi. Go ahead. Sorry. Hi. Thank you very much for your talk. Just a technical question. You report a lot of uh, data on H2O2 emission. I was wondering if you looked at antioxidants, which could affect the, uh, the reading of the assay. Did you see any impact of nitrate or IFAT feeding on mitochondrial antioxidants? Um, we've looked at some generic ones. Uh, and we haven't seen any increase in the antioxidant capacity. And the other thing is, is uh, a lot of the in vitro work, unless it's in the matrix, uh, we're supposed to be trying to outcompete it with the availability of the Amplex Red and the HRP that we're putting in. Um, I, I do think that if anybody's done these experiments, you get like a sigmoidal response. And sometimes I worry that the delay at the beginning is depleting the antioxidants. But our understanding has always been that the capacity of the system when you get there is then independent in that in vitro environment of the antioxidants. But in vivo, we haven't seen any change in the antioxidants that we've looked at. But we haven't done a complete list. We've only looked at maybe four total. Okay, thank you. Last question, go ahead. Yeah, Lawrence Kazak, McGill <coughs> University. Um, a, a couple points. I think it's really interesting. I'd, we can get together and talk about maybe differences in our <coughs> mitochondrial experiments. One thing I want to note, though, is that human fat is not the same as mouse fat. Human and white adipose tissue is not the same as brown adipose tissue. So we know in human, in human CKMT1 and MT2 are important. We don't fully understand their role in human adipose tissue. But in the murine system, we have never been able to detect any other isoform other than CKB. And in the paper that Bruce was referring to, we delete CKB and we trace creatine into phosphocreatine and completely lose the ability of any phosphorylation. So that, and that happens not only at the whole cell level, but in, in mitochondria. And I think that data really proves that CKB is the dominant uh, isoenzyme, at least in murine brown adipose tissue. Um, 
So, so I, I think, I, so that, my question was kind of similar to Bruce. I don't know why you guys focused on CKMT1, and I think the reason was is from the human data, right? But human adipose is not mouse adipose. I, so I would, I would I think, agree that human is, yeah. and mouse are always different, so I would agree with that point. Uh, and I, I think that you've done very elegant work on the brain uh, isoform. I would, we didn't study the brown adipose tissue purposely because you've done such a, such a fantastic job of doing that. And we were really just interested in trying to tease apart maybe some of these subtle responses based on the data that you did have showing that CKMT1 was changing in these different responses as well. In human. That was in human. Yep. Yeah. Um, and <clears throat> the, the last thing I kind of wanted, just in a comment, um, the CL chronic exposure that you used. Four days. Uh, f for, uh, to try to induce the cycle, to, to see the cycle, right? You said you used chronic CL. Um, we, we now know, I have a talk tomorrow, if you're interested, you can come. We know that the alpha adrenergic receptor is critical for regulating the expression of the futile creation cycle gene. So it's probably activation of the beta-3 pathway might not be sufficient. Yep, and, and, oh, and, no. and uh, I will acknowledge that your work has been in brown or in cold as well. So that's one of the main differences between what we've done uh, is you've used cold exposure and we've used CL. Great. Thanks, Dr. Holloway. <clears throat>